Tom and Jamie decided to open up with somebody's knocking at your door, which was not their original opening hymn selection because it was going to preach on that idea. And you know, the image, somebody's knocking at your door, for me, did not first start off with the idea of Jesus. I kind of searched my mind for ways that I think about this idea of how someone outside the house is trying to get our attention inside the house. And the first thing I thought of was uh, my mother sold Avon when we were little, which meant all the kids had to go distribute those brochures on people's porches. And Avon's signature method of doing this was to ring the doorbell and then leave the book. Of course, here we were kids just hating to do anything like this with adults that we do not know. And somebody hear the ding dong, you know, the Avon lady was calling. The idea that it's some salesman or somebody's going to be knocking at the door. Then I thought of a more humorous version of it uh, that became prominent in the late 1970s. After the movie Jaws had been a sensation all the way around the world, Saturday Night Live was in its infancy as a comedy program. It's now been around for forever. But one of the most memorable series of skits that they did during those Jaws years was somebody's knocking at your door, but in a different way. The preacher knocking at the door was called the, the land shark. All you saw was the snout and the teeth of it. Uh, and what it would be, the little skit would work, is that somebody would be by themselves in their apartment, there'd be a knock at the door. And then uh, the person would say, who's there? And the other one would say, the plumber. And they'll say, well, I didn't call a plumber. And then there's silence, who's there? Pizza delivery. I didn't order a pizza. And in the first instance, he says, who's there? He says, telegram. And the lady gets up, with, okay, and she opens up the door, and the land shark reaches in and eats her. So, you know, there's several different instances of all of that where the person's ultimately tricked into answering the door. In fact, the whole idea someone you don't know is knocking at your door is sort of the keystone to most scary or horror films. The idea that whatever is unknown, whatever is alien, whatever is out there is either going to eat you up, make a slave. Nothing good is going to happen from knocking at the door. So the church, of course, uses this imagery. In fact, they've used it long before uh, Saturday Night Live ever existed or in any of the horror, scary films of our era. Uh, so that the gospel that you just heard is the gospel always proclaimed the evening before the funeral mass. Typically, the uh, service, the vigil service, is held in the funeral home. And it's an integral piece of that service. Every deacon and every priest has basically proclaimed that gospel literally more than almost any other kind of gospel because it's used every time. And once again, that image of door knocking is right there. The idea is that we're supposed to be vigilant, waiting on the master's arrival. You can almost miss what's really being said, that God comes, Jesus comes, you want to say it that way, God comes and knocks on the door, waiting for our answer. See, the ideas were to be vigilant, to expect the docking of the door whenever it comes, the most unexpected time, perhaps, for each and every one of us, that we can actually answer that door in confidence because the person on the other side is not the land shark or alien monster, but it is Jesus Christ himself. And then it goes further. When the door is answered by the person that's ready to answer the door, they're invited in. We're there to recline a table when the Lord girds himself and waits on them. There's really no better scriptural image of what heaven is going to be like than the idea that the Lord will knock on our door at a time of his particular choosing. And if we're aware of who's on the other side, we will, without any uh, fear, open that door and be received into our heavenly inheritance. The second reading, which uh, is the letter to the Hebrews, is actually making a reference to the reading from Exodus we did, I think, two weekends ago, the story of Abraham and Sarah. And the Exodus reading has some details that we didn't hear in that first reading. Three visitors came to visit Abraham. Uh, he knew that they were visitors. He wanted to show hospitality. And so a great deal of trouble was then uh, entered into in order to prepare a proper feast for them. And at the end of the feast, the visitors said to Abraham, giving up the reason why they were coming in the first place, was that uh, they would return next year, and surely when they returned, Abraham would have a son. We learned in our reading to the Hebrews this weekend why this was so shocking to Abraham and Sarah. It's revealed to us that Abraham's very advanced in age, near death, as the line I think said, and Sarah's well beyond 
beyond her childbearing years. But see, God has made an almost unbelievable promise that they are going to be fruitful, that they are going to obtain an inheritance, and that the uh, generations that come after them will be more, more numerous than the sands on the shore of the sea or the number of the stars of heaven. Again, in our Hebrews reading this weekend, we learned that Abraham and Sarah, and with their children, once they're born, proceed to a strange land. They don't know where they're going. They're leaving the only homeland they know, and they do this because they have utter confidence where God is leading them. The story even concludes that they don't see the end, the part where the inheritance was promised. From afar, they glimpse something, but they don't quite see it. And of course, by our own settled theology, when their moment of real death took place, somebody was knocking at the door. The same visitors, we think the Trinity, that came and visited them before, Jesus Christ himself, not yet revealed, opening the door to their heavenly inheritance. Which is why that reading opens up that faith is evidence of what is not seen. Let's face it, when someone's knocking at the door and we don't know who they are, it can be worrisome. It might be the land shark, but it also might be Jesus Christ. So in the gospel reading, then, as I said, it's used a prominent part of our funeral liturgy. Uh, it also brings up this whole idea of what happens when we die. I wrote about it in the column in the bulletin this weekend, because most of us have a backwards version of it, me included, by the way, when I'm not thinking about it. The idea is that somehow, when we die, we're going to knock on heaven's door to quote the Bob Dylan song, knocking on heaven's door and hoping somebody's going to answer and let us in. There's even parables to that extent about knocking on the door, the master's already gone, he doesn't open up. It's an image that many people have, a danger, a fear that they have about death, that they're going to knock on the door and nobody is going to answer. Or if someone answers, it's a land shark who's simply a figure for the devil. So this gospel turns that all in its head. We are not the one who knocks at the door. It says rather clearly that we are to wait and be vigilant and the master will knock at the door and ask us to let him in. This, I think, is the most powerful glimpse we have of what our death is going to look like. Now, I'm like the rest of you. I'm not particularly thrilled thinking about it. You know, I'm Benedictine trained. I spent five years in their monastery at St. Mindred Seminary. And one of the prominent things of their rule of Benedict is to keep your death before you every day. I remember thinking the first time we heard that, do they put that on the recruitment brochure? Who wants to join a group that's so morose like that? It took me longer time with them to really understand what they were saying. Keeping our death before us is not meant to be morose or macabre or to be fearful. It's actually to remind us that you and I are sojourners. We're pilgrims. This, while it feels like home, is not our homeland. We will only know that homeland in its perfection and in its fullness when the Lord knocks on the door and we open the door to let him in and he invites us in where we recline at the table and he girds himself and he serves them. Maybe another way to think of this is a, a book that I've been reading and I used it in a homily a few weeks ago. Uh, it's been pretty influential with me in this last year, and I've read lots about grief and dying and how we work with people. It's something I do for a living, so it's always good to read the contemporary writing on it. A book that really has caught my interest is a book called Visions, Trips, and Crowded Rooms. It comes from a uh, doctor who becomes a believer uh, who does primarily his work with those who are dying. And when you're around the dying, as I've told you before, often enough, you begin to see certain patterns that don't make sense. Frequently, dying people mention that they're seeing people who've been dead for a very long time. And we're standing in the room on firm ground knowing that they're having a hallucination or something. It just doesn't seem real. Or they might mention that the room is filled with people. I'd anointed somebody two weeks ago who insisted the room was filled with people, and there were only three of us in there. Here I am preaching this. I look at the other person like, I don't see anybody else in here. You know, when you're really catching that, you're wondering, what is that person seeing? Or the other version, that they're going on some type of journey. When you know they're in that hospital bed, they can't even go to the bathroom. They have to have assistance. They're not going anywhere. And even when they do die, someone else is going to take them to the funeral home. Someone else is going to say, 
celebrate the funeral mass, and someone else is going to bury them in the sacred ground of the cemetery, not this notion that they themselves are going on a trip, a trip worth savoring. So from the book, I wanted to share this with you. <clears throat> While at the bedside of my patients, I often suggest to family members that there's no point in telling their father that he's hallucinating or that Joseph is dead and can't possibly be here in this room. For all we know, the veil that separates life and death is lifted in the last moments of life, and those who are dying may be more in touch with that world than with ours. Instead of denying a patient's reality, I respond by asking questions. What does your loved one say? Can you describe what else you see? Perhaps a deceased family member is telling the patient that it's okay to die, or maybe they're reminiscing about growing up together. I've heard people tell their dying loved ones, it's great that Betty is here, or I know that mother would come to meet you, or I'm so glad Jeff is with you now. If you find the concept of a dead loved one greeting you on your deathbed impossible or ridiculous, consider what I finally realized as a parent. You protect your children from household dangers. You hold their hands when they cross the street on the first day of school. You take care of them when they have the flu, and you see them through as many milestones as you can. Now fast forward 70 years or after, you yourself have passed away. What if there really is an afterlife and you receive a message that your son or daughter will be dying soon? If you were allowed to go to your child, wouldn't you? It's a beautiful thought when we think about this, that the dying process, which so frightens us, may actually be the most consoling thing, but not while we're observing it, only when we're the ones living it. Just like Abraham, we have to operate by faith, evidence of things that are unseen. I'm like the rest of you. I'd rather the whole thing be stripped out so there's absolutely no mystery involved. And even then, I probably wouldn't believe it. You know, the real reality is our faith has to lead us to where that's going. As you know, I've been a long time fan of the film Shawshank Redemption. I preach it when I think it's relevant, often over through the years, because I think that that cultural uh, film uh, that's so well known by so many people has actually themes of death and dying and resurrection and the afterlife, but you kind of have to look for them. They're rather resonant. You know, the film involves basically the story of Red and Andy, two men who are in prison for the rest of their lives, and they forge a friendship, which is the real light that happens to them in the midst of the darkness of the prison. Rather famously, at the end of the film, Red breaks out of the prison, the first person to actually escape Shawshank Penitentiary. A little bit later in the film, uh, then, uh, that was Andy, then Red is paroled and gets out and finds a letter Andy has written him and they reunite. Many people just take the film straight up, but one way to interpret that whole ending part of the film, if you've seen it, is that actually Andy dies. He doesn't break out of prison. His death liberates him from the prison. The rest of it is a metaphor of all of that happening, the way that ironic twist of the plot really turns. And then when Red is paroled out of prison, once again, a death as he goes on a journey, a journey where he receives a letter that leads him further on the journey. And here's what the letter says. Dear Red, if you're reading this, you've gotten out. And if you come this far, maybe you're willing to come a little further. You remember the name of the town, don't you? I could use a good man to help me get my project on wheels. I'll keep an eye out for you and the chessboard ready. Remember, Red, hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things, and no good thing ever dies. And the Red, as he begins this journey, still wondering what's awaiting him at the end of it, is that not that vision we have on our deathbed? Red says these words, I find I'm so excited I can barely sit still or hold a thought in my head. I think it is the excitement of only a free man can feel. A free man at the start of a long journey where conclusion is uncertain. I hope I can make it across the border. I hope I can see my friend and shake his hand. I hope the Pacific is as blue as it has been in my dreams. I hope. Hope the evidence of things unseen. Faith, the foundation of everything we're doing when we celebrate the Eucharist. 
I just believe it's sweet just to simply accept this, that when we die, someone's knocking at our door, and it will be Jesus, and it will be all glorious. But there's even better news for you and I. Every time we celebrate the sacrament of the church, God is knocking at our door. When we're conceived in our mother's womb, a moment none of us can even remember or have any real biological sense of, God was knocking at the door. The moment that we're baptized into the death and then the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it happens because God is the one knocking on the door. The parents who present their children for baptism and the adult who presents him or herself for baptism is actually hearing the door knock from God and entering into the waters of baptism. That first reconciliation, when you ever have it, God, God is knocking at the door. He's not waiting for us to wake him up and confess our sins. He's already ready there to forgive us, to have us recline at table and wait on us. And in the sacrament of marriage and holy orders, most certainly, God is knocking at the door for a man and a woman to become husband and wife, for a man to become a deacon, priest, or bishop. Once again, it is God knocking at the door, God extending the invitation. And in the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, which frequently happens under difficult or at least scary uh, times when it's happening, when we're beset by illness or just fear of death, all the anxieties that come with that, the healing of the sacrament is not is not what we think, a medical healing. The healing is the touch of Jesus Christ. That's only possible if God has knocked on the door and we've let him in. We let him in when we believe that's Jesus touching me. And his touching me heals me and makes me pure. And I saved the best for last. When you and I receive Holy Communion, it's the one repeatable thing we can do over and over again and again as we're doing this morning. Somebody's knocking at the door. The minister says the body of Christ. That's Jesus. When we receive the body of Christ, he touches us, either a hand or a tongue or both, and that touch is no different than the anointing touch. It's instantly cleansing, instantly purifying. We are at the table being served, and the Lord is waiting on us every time you receive communion. It's actually true that you only need one sacrament because there's no addition to it. Why do we repeat the sacraments? Because you and I live in a crazy mixed up world that has the secularization and all the different things that happen. We're caught up in the existentialism of the era just like everyone else is and we need signs that feed our faith. Signs that remind us our life is not going to end in darkness or in purposelessness or in endless suffering that our life and the lives of our loved one end in a knock at the door. And the person knocking at the door is Jesus, inviting us to now receive the inheritance he's prepared for us. So as we continue with our lives and continue with our faith, what a gift it is if we can actually recognize that even under the most ordinary circumstances when we celebrate liturgy, we're in the presence of something so extraordinary, so beyond our perception, literally beyond our understanding. We are seeing what Abraham believed, that something better was waiting. We're journeying as Abraham and our loved ones have journeyed, not where we don't know where we're going, but the certitude that when the door is, when someone knocks at the door, it will be Jesus. All we have to remember is we face difficulties, and I promise you, you will continue to face them. Me too. Remind yourself as often as possible. Somebody's knocking at your door, and that person is Jesus Christ.